drücken. All right, can anyone see this? Okay, guys online, can you see this? Not yet, it still says you're starting. Oh, now we can see it. Now we can see it, okay. Well, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, I think next week is our, is our last lecture. And um, I, I would hope that um, anyone, or, yeah, can have as much, as much class participation, in-person in participation as possible. There's plenty of bringing bicycles and stuff next week. So um, you can always learn more by feeling and touching. Um, let's see this guy, uh, Eric Vanderplatz. I, uh, I introduced you to him uh, several lectures back. Uh, fortunately, Professor Vanderplatz died last Wednesday. So I had an update slide, um, obviously minor. Uh, yeah, it's too bad. He was a uh, he was um, a brilliant man. Um, he died in Colorado Springs. He wasn't that old. He was only in his mid seventies. And um, I think the funeral was about two weeks. I don't I don't know what he died of. I haven't really said much other than he had some problem in the hospital, but that's about it. So, what your professors might have, guys? I don't mean me. I mean you know the real professors. Hello. Last week we we played a game. We played uh, Monaco versus Space Frame. Okay, and um, so I was um, actually in Texas on Tuesday. Texarkana. It's not it's actually a town called Texarkana. Canada. It's not it's not Texar County with an accent. It's actually Texarkana, K A L A. And um, anyway, I was visiting a, a client that makes railroad cars. And um, they had one of these guys blow up, so I've been investigating that thing for a while. Um, I don't think they did anything wrong. Um, but anyway, up or in? down and up. So the bottom blew out, and then the thing went up in the air. And, but so um, these two implode, not the right word. No, they actually, this is actually right. explode. This is actually an outlet. Yeah. yeah, this was, this was an outcome. Um, yeah, I think it was a stress corrosion cracking problem, but that's, that's besides the point. I'm, you know, we're still working on this. Um, I could be wrong. It could be something else, but, yeah. but anyway, I I'm looking at this thing and I'm realizing that wow, this thing is a monocoque, and I didn't even sort of think of it at the time. Um, I'm watching them build these these things. They have a, a factory where they build these and they repair these things, and, and they they take these these gigantic sheets of steel. Okay, and the sheets are anywhere between like three to an inch thick and like 28 inch thick, and so they they laser out the, these things and then they roll them and then they weld them. And I've got a big hoop. The hoops themselves are like really wimpy. Like they just like, like I mean, it's like they, they sort of displace under their own weight. So like they sort of, you just put it on the ground and try to like it forms an oval because they're so wimpy. It's not very stiff. And they, they somehow scrape these things up so they're perfectly round. And then they, they weld them together using submerged arc welding, which is a cool process where they're basically welding in a pool of sand. It keeps all the, keeps all the oxygen out to get a really nice, beautiful weld. Anyway, and so they, they weld these things together and they put these things on the front and back. They call them headers. They're roll spun. And uh, I, I realized that these things are monocots. So you, you have the trucks on both ends, you have this big sausage basically. And then it's, you know, it's under bending one basically because there's weight inside and it has its own weight. So and, uh, I was thinking like how amazing it is because these, these tank cars, you know, they, they stack these things up with hundreds of, hundreds of cars long. And I was thinking like the first car right behind the locomotive, the first tank car right behind the locomotive has to support all the cars behind it. And I'm thinking this thing is like under this horrible either bending or tensile load or some combination of both with all these cars behind it. I'm thinking going up a hill is even worse. And then to, to kind of say like, wow, some of these things are really thin. Some of them are like three of an inch thick. You know, the, the, the ones that have to like maintain pressure or have stuff in them that like is under pressure, they're thicker, they're like three quarters of an inch or a little bigger. But, but the other ones are a lot thinner. And I'm thinking, how the hell does that work? Like, 
all these parts. I mean, this is, I don't know, it's amazing. This thing is probably about, I don't know, 15, 20 feet in diameter, and yet it's supporting all these cars behind it, hundreds of cars. It's just, it's just amazing. I'm surprised it works. This material is it's just a low carbon steel. It's, you know, it's got um, 0.23 weight percent carbon, it's got maybe 1.6% manganese. Tiny bit, you know, and then everything else is pretty clean after that. So it's nice clean steel, but but it's not exactly like you're using high alloy steel like a chrome audience, but, but it's, uh, it shocked me how much weight these things can, can handle. So. But there's nothing, there's no frame underneath. So no. everything goes through the, the like vessel, basically. Like exactly. The the, and load is the vessel. vessel. So there's there's a coupler here, and there's a coupler on the other side. Okay, and they are they this this is a frame right here. And it's welded to this big sausage. <laughs> okay, on both sides, there's another frame over here, right? And then the coupler is at the trucks, the wheels here. There's just a little pin coming up that sticks to the load frame instead of there. But basically, the load goes from from these these subframes into this gigantic sausage, and that's it. That's what supports all this part going up the hill. I always assumed that there was something connecting the wheels. Yeah. So. There actually is one of these cars out behind the police station, the MIT police station. You can go look at it. I mean, you can't get real close, but you can go look at it. Um, sometimes, sometimes if they have something in there like liquid nitrogen, they'll have a, a subframe that takes up the load. And it's just like a single, almost you know, thick wall, uh, rectangular cross section tube that goes, goes front to back. Um, and in that case, yeah, the, 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 the subframe is taking up the load, but those are the, those are the exception case. This is the typical case where the where the main body of the tank takes up the load. So this is this is really my problem. Anyway, okay. So, so is the end truck the same like this is the body? Normally, yeah. Yeah. They they um they roll spin these things. Yeah, so they got a they get a big like big uh big disc and then they put a big thing that's turning and they got a, a big hydraulic arm that sort of pushes on it and kind of wedges it over. So there's a there's a company called Spincraft in, in Bedford that does this. I just did it. Yeah, they they're actually that's how they're making the capsule for the Artemis uh, rocket for NASA. So they just spin form these things. So some some of these are some of these are made out of stainless steel. So like if they're they have to um, they have to transport certain chemicals that you know basically keep the keep the low carbon steel and make them out of stainless. But even then, and they use a high quality stainless. I keep the P16 stainless, which is like an 18% chromium. Um, but the, in, in that case, you're using like a half an inch thicker stuff. And, and the yield strengths are a lot stronger. And, they, and, the, and the sensor strengths are a lot stronger. So I guess they can handle it. Because they're just amazing. These things are tugging these, all these cars up the hill, you know, we putted these things behind it. It's amazing. I never would have thought that would work. But obviously, I've seen it before. So I know it works. Um, anyway, um, okay. So last week, we talked a little. Any questions about the rail car? Any guys online? No? Okay. Um, None for me. None for you. Okay. Did someone say something in the chat here? Like, is it ever pushed or always? Um, they do seem to practice Absolutely. They're breaking. Because, like, I have seen them as, like, the, there's, like, internet coming on. Like, there's, like, internet coming on. Yeah. Pushing. So they'll put one of the, they can put, they can put one of those in neutral, basically. One of the, one of the locomotives. These things do have their own individual hydraulic brake system, but I'm sure there's still some compressive load under braking, especially the one that's up in front. They probably alternate between compressive and sensitive as the thing slows down. Yeah, it's going down. There's something right. So interesting stuff. I, I never would have guessed that would work. Um, We talked some a little bit last time about space frame versus monocoque, which is the more efficient one. And I don't think anybody knows the conclusive answer to that. I don't think it's really been studied really carefully. Um, I tend to think based on the quality optimization results and where those optimizers are distributing mass that somewhere between is probably the best solution. That's kind of what I showed this for. Um, okay, so today is bicycle day after this, guys. So we're talking about bicycles pretty much the whole lecture. And I think. So here you're right, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So there's a lot to learn here. So it's not just like my hobby I'm spending today. 
just there's a lot there is a lot of interesting things here about truck optimization. Bicycle is really the bicycle industry has really done an amazing job of, of light weighting and all the principles that we've spoken about here, materials, precipitation hardening, and bending stresses and torsion and they've and you know optimization tools, they've really done a better job, I think, than like almost any other industry using those tools. Uh, maybe the aerospace industry has done better than them, but certainly the automotive, like the mainstream automotive industry hasn't done anywhere near what the bicycle industry has done. I mean, not even a thin galaxy of things. But um, anyway, so here's a here's a timeline um, of uh, from going from 1970 to basically the present of how bicycle bicycle frames have evolved since since 1970. And on the top row, the, the red dots, those are steel. Uh, those are a couple examples of I think some milestone steel frames. And then uh, below that, the blue dots are aluminum. Those are how some the milestone aluminum frames and how they've changed. And then below that in green is titanium, and then here in this graphic color is carbon fiber, and how, how they've changed the time. I don't expect you to read this; it's kind of an eye test. I'm going to go through. I'm going to not going to show you all of these. I'm going to show you a couple which I think are noteworthy. So we've we've already talked about this frame. This is a 1970 uh, steel bike. It's made out of a chrome aluminum alloy. The um, the lugs are, I believe, they're either welded together or they're investment cast. I'm not sure on this particular bike, but uh, the tubes are. Very thin walled, and they are grazed with grass into those lugs. It's um, it's a really great way to make a bicycle frame. These frames last basically forever unless you crash them, and or let them rust out. Um, but but these things last forever. They ride great. They're, you know, they're stiff, they're light, they handle well. They're, they're amazing, and they and they built frames like this for you know decades and decades and decades, and people you know. Men and women raced in the Alps on these things and descended at high speeds and did all kinds of fun stuff. And, and they were, that was the technology for many, many years. But people always want to do better, which is a good thing. And, um, so this frame here is an interesting example. This is a chrome molly, but it's heat treated. So the tubes are heat treated. And then in order to make sure that you don't, in order to, to avoid changing the heat treat on the material, you have to grade it at a very, very low temperature. They don't get the metal through clotting, grow the grains, or over over ace the precipitate. And so in this case, they they use silver sawing. So you get a, a little artisan who's very, very skilled with the settling torch, and they, they heat this thing up just a tiny little bit. And they again there's a little bit of brass and it goes in there, and the, the joint and the lug there, it's it's so tightly together that the capillary actually sucks in the molten silver, and then you, you get a nice strong joint. And um so the Reynolds Company in England um, was big on this, this type of tubing. This is called the Reynolds 753, if you're here to see it. It's, um, like I said, it's a, it's a heat-treated chromoly or chromanganese, I can't remember. But um, these, using this tube set, you kind of get a special certification from the from Reynolds in order to build these to show that you could keep the temperature low enough to stop from losing heat-treating the tubes. Um, and, uh, Change made Japanese company made some of these two. Um, lots of you know, lots of Tour de France's and fewer to Italy's were four one on these. Okay. Uh, um, fast forward several years to uh, mid 2010s, so 2015, and that's this bike here. So this is um, uh, this is a huge change in steel technology. This is a a stainless margin steel, also made by Reynolds. So this is a this is an alloy of chrome and moly and nickel and and, um, and it's a, it's a secondary precipitating alloy, kind of like the aluminum I showed you. So these these tubes were the way they made the tubes on these bikes. Actually, is they they took a, a flat sheet, they rolled them up, they welded along the line where the two edges met, and I think they they heat treat those. So they have to do a solution treat, punch and temper, and then an artificial age. And the, the strength of these tubes is staggering. It's like 1.3 or 1.2 gigapascals. So amazingly strong stuff and stainless. So you don't have to worry about it rusting. You might have to worry about galvanic corrosion of parts that are made into like aluminum, but, but really, really strong stuff. And then they go ahead and they TIG weld these together. And TIG welding is not my favorite way to, you know, to do things like this because it's high temperature and you, you certainly lose strength in the joint. <clears throat> um, Nonetheless, this is that's how they make this bike. It, it has like carbon fiber core banks. Anyway, um, 
These bikes are, this is probably one of the lightest fuel primes there is, is this one right here. Not B lights, but plug to it. Okay, this bike here I find really interesting. This is the um, this is a bike that was made by this is Krupp. This is a this is a big German steel concern. It's the biggest German steel company. And um, yeah, they made this in like 2000, 2017 or 2018. And um, I'll tell you a story about this. But how, how, how they make this is they, they I think put it they stamp both halves. They, they use a dual phase steel, so it's ferrite and, and, uh, and martensite. Okay. And so it's basically ferrite with little pieces of martensite in it. And they, they stamp the two halves and they put them together. And then they laser weld around it. So, so the reason I'm so interested or excited by this frame is that this frame takes, takes advantage of both materials and geometry. These frames here, they didn't take much advantage of geometry, right? The, the stresses are very, very high, like down here where the crank sit, okay? Um, the high strength joint, high, the high stress joint effect is actually right here, with the head tube and the down tube, but, but the tubes are just round, right? So <clears throat> there's no, they're not really taking much advantage of geometry. There. They could, they could make that oval, which is what these guys did, with that joint. Okay, they could have done that oval, which would be using geometry and materials, not just materials. So I'm interested, I'm very intrigued by this book. Now, <clears throat> here's the stupid story behind this one. In 2016, I actually wrote a letter to the Olympic International Steel Organization in Belgium. Uh, they're part of uh, World's, uh, World Steel, I think it's called. And I, I knew the director a long time ago <clears throat> when I worked for the industry. He didn't like me very much, but uh, I figured I'd try anyway. So I pitched to see if they would if they would fund a steel bike as a project. Because the steel industry <clears throat> very much let the, the high-end bicycle industry go away. Right. So all the riders, the pro riders are riding carbon fiber bikes. Nobody's riding steel bikes anymore. The steel industry let that go away. And I thought, I thought, you know, this is there's no question that carbon fiber bikes are better than steel. <clears throat> but the problem is, is that if you as I told you before, if you crash them or there's any kind of off axis loading, they just, they just they, they crash in a million little pieces and you know, sweep them up with a brush, right? So, I, you know, steel is, is possibly a better solution for normal people who are, don't get a new bike if they crash automatically. So, I, I always wanted to see a better steel frame. And I actually I pitched this project to, to the, um, uh, the Max Planck Institute for Steel Research in Germany. Because they were doing a lot of work on these margin steels, stainless margin steels, and I thought you could you can combine it with what's called the trip effect. You, guys know, you might know the trip effect, right? No, the trip effect is um, you get a when you when you transform from martensite or when you transform from austenite to martensite, you can get a little <clears throat> um, a volume increase. So that that means that when you're forming these steels. So actually, they, they can form further before they break, so you can stamp them. But this is this is one of the big problems. As you go higher and higher strength steel, the strain to failure goes down, so you can't form them. So it's very limited in the, in the geometry you can use. But with this thing called the trip effect, you can take advantage of during the forming. You can you can initiate this um, transformation from austenite to martensite, and then you get this expansion, and so you can form a lot further. So sometimes by several tens of percent, you can form further. But um, so this is my thought: is that we used to build these frames with build steel frames with hydro forming, where you, you have a tube and you you fill it up with water under high pressure and it expands into a mold. And you could, if you could have a material that was was had the trip effect, had the margin effect for strength, had the stainless effect for um, for corrosion resistance. That wow, would this be great? We could you know, make these bicycle frames that basically last forever. And um, I pushed and pushed and pushed, and I got turned down. So so it didn't work. It didn't fly. But the thing that was really irritating is that this bicycle came out a year later. And, and, um, and also interesting that World Steel Organization started publishing articles on steel bicycles like within six months too. So um, I actually wrote the people, wrote an email on the people who are LinkedIn, I just found out, right? I actually wrote them an email, a LinkedIn email saying, hey guys, you know, I, I, I presented this press presentation, I had the PowerPoint presentation. The world steel like a year ago. Did you guys see this by any chance? I never heard back. But um, so who knows? I mean, I don't. I don't really need credit. I don't really care. But honestly, I'm, I'm happy somebody did something with it. But uh, unfortunately, I don't think this bike did very well. I don't think it's still making. I think it's still very well. 
they really were several times that they were going to start with fiber so it's a hard sell. But I think you can still do better. I just think that I think you're limited with the dual phase steel as far as how strong you can get in the pulp thickness. Okay, um, aluminum bikes. So this is one of the very early aluminum bikes. This is from 1979, made by a French company called Vitus. And they used 5,000 series aluminum tubes. Okay, so 5,000 series of aluminum. You guys know, you know anything about 5,000 versus like 6,000? Go ahead, Robbie. Oh, so the 5,000 series is usually much more flammable. Right. Um, I think it's not treated, or all of the 5,000 is not treated, um, so, whereas the 6,000 is also. Exactly. This, which also makes the 6,000 uh, a lot more brittle because their yield and their tensile closeness will be really close together. Yeah. yeah, right. Very good. In case you guys couldn't hear that because the microphone's facing the other direction. Robin was just telling us that the uh, the 5000 series aluminums can't be heat treated. The only way to strengthen a 5000 series aluminum is through work hardening. And um, she was also saying that um, that uh, 6000 series is precipitation hardable, but the difference that the, the strain difference between ultimate and temp, ultimate and yield is very small. So it's kind of a, considered more of a brittle material, whereas 5000 series is much more ductile. So uh, 5,000 series is basically magnesium in there, like three and a half, four and a half, four and a half percent magnesium in with the aluminum. The, uh, the Navy likes to put chips out of, out of 5,000 series alloys because it's very corrosion resistant. And like you ever see like those, sometimes you see those big um, like tanker trucks driving down the road and they're made out of aluminum. Those are 5,000 series. And the reason they use 5,000 series is because they're not the painted. The paint would be very expensive. So they, they're, the corrosion resistance is, is good. So, the more out in general, the more alloy content you put in the movement of the less corrosion resistant it is, the more you can pass the paint and do something with it. Um, anyway, so the 5000 series tubes they use these cast aluminum uh, joints on the um, you know, the regular dot wrap, the head tube, the seat tube there, uh, drop outs, and um, people people rode these things for a long, long time. These things won a lot of races. Um, they're they're known to be like a real nudist, they're not very stiff. But you know, when you're doing big long races at hundreds of miles a day, like sometimes it's probably better to have a bike that's not that stiff. Um, so um, anyway, the, lots of lots of famous people won all kinds of races on these things. Um, this bike is, I think, more interesting. So th so this bike, I would say they they didn't use this bike. They didn't use very good materials and they didn't use very good geometry. <laughs> and they weren't they weren't that much lighter than steel. Only a couple hundred grams actually. Um, this right here. So this is from one of your classmates, Becca. This, this bike was made by Gary Klein. Gary Klein was a student here in the 70s. And apparently you guys have some type of, what do they call it, your um, oh, independent activities period? Yeah, I do. Say again? January. Okay. So, so apparently he, he started fussing around with this and some professor down in some lab somewhere around here, probably in the building. And he came up with this idea and I think they patented it. And Gary Klein graduated from MIT, graduated from MIT and he started his bicycle company. And they made these things for, for many years. Um, and eventually they got bought by track. But, but he was a student here. Um, Cannondale also came off aluminum, large two diameter frames, um, maybe four or five years after this. There's a big lawsuit between the two. I think I think Klein lost. Um, but um, it was just, this was a real innovation when these things came out. And what they, I think they used 6,000 series of aluminum, big diameter. Um, so in this case, they're doing better in the materials department. And they're doing better on the geometry, right? So they use that large diameter too. And, and effectively, what's going on here is they're saying that okay, aluminum can fatigue out, so we need to reduce the stress to the point where you get an acceptable number of cycles out of the frame. And so they want these bigger diameters in order to increase the cross-sectional area to lower the stress. And um, yeah, these things were were pretty innovative in the day when they came out. I remember. Um, it's well in '61. Yeah, they, they take well. I always love this ad. I think it's hysterical. It came up with see, see, the, the, people put their bikes on the roof rack. The, the, the note here was the car was so strong to pull up the car. Okay. Um, here is the first titanium plant. This was uh, this was built in the seventies by Teledon, and um, they were crazy expensive. It was thousands of dollars. No one could afford them. 
and they had all kinds of problems with fatigue and they weren't very stiff. And they made these out of uh, commercially pure titanium. So the yield strengths were, were really low. The ultimate strength was really low. The modules just like two thirds of steel that wasn't that stiff. They didn't, they didn't really take much advantage of tubes of, of geometry. They're just basically round tubes and they're not even that big in diameter. Okay, and so these frames were not a big success because they failed a lot and they were expensive as hell. And so titanium really didn't catch on for many years later. The um, ultimate in titanium frame, as far as I think the art got, I think is this frame right here. This is a 6.4. So I think it's so it's a 6% Canadian, 4% aluminum. I may have got that backwards. And this um this was a much stronger, stiffer frame. These were pretty successful in the marketplace, very stiff, very light. Um, the uh, the material, the 6 4 titanium, is too strong to form into tubes. So they actually bent these around a mandrel, like they would take a sheet of it, throw it out, and then and weld it along the seam. Um, and they, they did a pretty good job of geometry here. You can see the tubes are, you know, this, this is both well effect, right? This is materials and this is geometry. You can see how these tubes are ovalized in, in multiple different planes in order to provide maximum um, bending moment, right? So, so especially up here, you can see much, much this diameter here is, this, this is ovalized here, and this is ovalized the other direction. So that's kind of important to see. Um, and these things are titanium and last forever. I don't, I guess a lot of people thought that titanium wasn't stiff enough. And so it sort of lost market share to carbon fiber and carbon fiber got cheaper. But I don't know why these things sort of run well, popular, more well, popular because they're, they're certainly more crash resistant than a carbon fiber frame, but they're, but they're maybe a little bit heavier, still really light. So I would imagine this one's really stiff given all these big diameter you know, tubes and localized joints and whatnot. And these are tin molded again. Okay, here is the first carbon fiber bicycle frame. This was uh, 1975 by Exxon Graphtech. And um, they, again, they were very expensive. Uh, they actually start with an aluminum tube and then they wrap carbon fiber around the aluminum tube, cure it on there. And then they, they, built, they braid together steel lugs. So these joints here, these are made of steel. Then they, they welded them together. So uh, I'm sorry, they glued them together. They, they glued them together. They, so, so these are steel, these are carbon fiber and aluminum. They jointed them into one another and uh, they glued them together. And these, these were very expensive. A lot of them failed and they weren't that great to ride. And so they weren't very popular. It was not a success in the market. Um, they used the steel chromoly fork. This is 1975, so this is really old for bicycles. Um, this is a, a good use of materials, I think, but not a good use of geometry. It wasn't until about uh, 1986 that Kestrel came out with the true monocoque frame. At least they call it a monocoque. I would call it semi-monocoque or a mid-spectrum design, um, where they made this, this whole frame in one mold. So they got female molds, okay, and then they have like a, like a mantle of some sort that expands under heat or under pressure. So sometimes they'll use like a silicone mantle to lay the carbon fiber over the silicone mantle. And then they, they put the carbon fiber pre preprite on there, which is carbon fiber and epoxy kind of already mixed together in a sheet. It's sticky, so you can, you can get things to stick together, right? Put this in the mold, stick the whole thing in the furnace. The heat causes the silicone to expand, pushes the carbon fiber into the steel male mold or steel female mold. So, so it consolidates the fibers. Right, and uh, this is this is the first time everyone actually succeeded in doing a monocoque with this. And I think I think they ended up using a steel fork or a initially I think they had a steel fork, and then later on in 1989 they they put together a steel carbon fiber fork. But this is the I call this a mid-spectrum design because it's hard to call it a monocoque because it's sort of got this tubular structure, right, where you have individual discrete floating elements, structural elements. But but it's um. It's something on the space frame either because there's such there's there's no um, the tubes are subject to bending and, and torsion and not just pure tensile compression so it's not really a space frame either it's somewhere in between and these again were not that popular well I guess they were popular in this country I don't think they caught on Europe very well you never you never saw these in the pro European telecom or anything um, this is the first carbon fiber bicycle in the Tour de France 
And this is um, carbon Kevlar tubes, cast aluminum lugs, um, made by the French company Look, L-O-O-K. And they, they um, bonded the tube together um, in these lugs with epoxy. And then they set the whole thing up for and secure it. Um, I would say that this makes good use of materials but under optimized geometry. And uh, actually, they're restoring one of these right now. I found one that was kind of beat to hell. They're very rare. And I'm in the process of cleaning it up. I was hoping to bring it in this semester, but it wasn't ready in time. But anyway, this is the first, short, first bike to win the Tour de France. And here's that's the same bike right there. They painted it silver, but it's the same bike. And this is the 1986 Tour de France, which an American won. So Greg Lamont, the only American who ever won the Tour de France officially. And then here's where that technology is at today. So, Sophia, you asked about, about aerodynamics and how does that fit in? And I told you it's probably more important than weight and stiffness, which it really is. And um, this, is, uh, this is one of the state-of-the-art um, American bikes, Trek. And these things are, these guys spend crazy dollars, crazy dollars to run out wind tunnels and do studies. And they have mannequins, they have moving mannequins. They have, um, they do all kinds of crazy things. They, 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 they test these things different, they have different orientation with respect to the wind flow to see how, how much drag it produces. And uh, they, they go bananas. They spend millions of dollars on these things trying to get the aerodynamics right because it makes such a huge difference. And you can see like this whole thing is soulful. The whole frame is sculpted to keep wind from, from slowing it down. They've invented all kinds of new airfoil shapes. And um, there's, there's about three companies in the world, I think, bicycle companies in the world that they can compete at this level, meaning that they have the resources to, to um, not only do the carbon fiber correctly, meaning minimize the amount of material that they're using for weight, but also you know, really dig and get the aerodynamics right. So there's a lot of bikes out there that. Um, look like they're aerodynamic, but the people making them don't necessarily really have the resources to test them in a wind tunnel. So they may not be all that aerodynamic. They may look it, but they might not be. This, this thing is real. These things are really good tested in wind tunnels. It, they're a, just an amazing piece of technology. I would, I mean, these things are expensive. They're several thousands of dollars. You don't, you're not going to buy this back outside of MIT, right? You know, in a bike stand somewhere. But um, anyway, these things are on fire. I, I keep saying these are the most structurally optimized consumer um, products there are. So, so this, this I would say they make optimum use of materials and they make optimum use of geometry in order to get the stiffest, lightest, most aerodynamic structure. And there's probably, I, I, would, I would bet for sure that there's some compromise here, right? Where they've maybe given up some, some weight uh, or stiffness in order to get an aerodynamic because it's, it wins races. Anyway, so that's it for bicycles. Um, any questions? Do you have the blue bike though? What is it? The blue bike? What's the blue bike? The one oh, the ones that, the, like, that said like Citibank on the side or something? Or? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Um, they're pretty heavy, aren't they? Yeah, they're also the, <laughs> it's like the female version, but it's just kind of a crossbar. Right. Um, it'd just be interesting because like they're everywhere. They're super hard to use. So. And it's not meant for racing, so right. it wasn't optimized for right. that exactly, but comparing it to so, really interesting. So I, I, I'm a big fan of sex programs. Um, they have a very different duty setting, don't they? It's a very different purpose in life than, than winning races. Mm -hmm. And I, I would I would say a more noble purpose actually. Keep cars off the road, people, you know, get people exercise, get people way to be without putting more cars on the road. Um, so they're they're all about sustainable business. You know, I've, I've had, for example, I've had clients who have these scooter services, you know, these electric scooter services. And like people just thrash those things. They just beat the crap out of them for fun. You know, just let's see how many times I can jump off the sidewalk, you know, and try to break this thing. Eventually they break it and they get hurt and sue the company. But um, anyway, I'm just joking. <laughs> um, but so that, that's more, the, that's more the, the duty cycle of those blue bikes. Right. They have they have to be ready for the worst to do things and try to get the people jumping downstairs. And do you think they probably be more optimized for the cross loads, basically, instead of for sure uh, sacrificing any cross load resistance yeah. to, to I mean, everything else? 
it's um you know i have i have one of um i've got a bike like it's not this exact brand but i've got one like i've got one like this okay. and the um so this is the heat treated chromoly piece okay the in the middle of the top two right here the wall thickness on my bike is about 350 micron it's super thin so you're fine as long as you're doing this, just like a railroad bike, right? But the second you do this, you got a big problem. And even, I mean, the tight, you know, a little, you, you can you can actually squeeze, if you squeeze the tube like this, you can actually feel it displacing. That's how thin it is. And, you know, there's a tiny little dent in there now because it sat in my parents' garage when I was in college, you know, in grad school. But, um, you know, I'm waiting for it to collapse, basically, because I don't, <laughs> one little dent, you know. But, but that's the thing, like, these blue bikes, they can't, they, they can't handle that. I imagine those things are just... Well, yeah, because they don't even have the crossbar. But the, yeah. the, the tubes are pretty big. I bet you these are... It wouldn't surprise me if these are cast aluminum. Maybe not. Maybe they're just eight huge steel pieces. So this is the thing we were going to talk about in a couple minutes here. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's the effect of, of um, styling and how that can drive weight into the structure. Um, Um, but yeah, it's it's a it's a good counterpoint. You're, you're right. It's a duty site. It's so much different. It's kind of like um, subway cars, right? And subway cars were designed with the, the heck beaten out of them for decades and decades. You know, like in Chicago, I used to ride the subway a lot when I was a grad student. There was the, the L there, and um, you know, it was always interesting. The cars are all made from stainless steel. The stainless steel is expensive and heavy, but when you plan on using something for decades, like these blue bikes, you probably plan on using them for decades. That's 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 what you do. You spend the money on things that make them last a long time. So the bigger picture costs less money to, to, think, to have have a vehicle that will operate for decades than have to replace it every five years. These these really high end racing bikes. I mean, these these pros don't ride them for more than a season or two, and then they're considered they're considered dead, basically. Like valley shoes, exactly. <laughs> College I dated this girl who was a ballerina. She had this gigantic garbage bag full of the, the pink, uh, the pink ballet shoes. They used to laugh. They're all like blood in the toe and stuff. It's pretty gross. But anyway, so so yeah, I mean that's um, it's, it's a good counterpoint. Thank you, Robin, because it's it's not, it's it's life mission is so much different than a racing bike. So yet yet still has to meet certain engineering requirements. I mean, I just, I also found it really interesting that they chose to have the design without the crossbar. Too, because right. I think that that would be easier to produce something that would last longer. For sure, for sure, for sure, for sure, it's better from the structural perspective. But I think they do it because it's maybe easy to get on. I think it's technically supposed to be like so people can look sturdy. Like, the so? Of it. so isn't that like the premium bike basically? Maybe but historically, like, yeah. Maybe it's also just easier to get on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, in my old age here, you know, it's getting harder to get between my, my leg over the bar. It's harder and harder. Accessibility makes more sense than like, gender. <laughs> I mean, I guess it, it satisfies that. Yeah. I think the, yeah. You know, I've got to be careful what I say on that. I get a lot of trouble. So I'll, I'll just say accessibility. Okay. Um, so there's a couple kind of loose ends here I want to mention about light weighting. The first one is fatigue. So um, as a material science major, Sophia, I know you are, you, you probably know this already, but but um, some metals can go at some combination of stress um, and cycles forever, and some materials can't. So steel, for example, there's there is some point, so here's a graph of Stress amplitude, so how far you're stressing things, you can something in fatigue loading, then number of cycles. Um, with steel, there's a point where the curve flattens out. It's not headed downward anymore. And if, if you design your, your structure over here somewhere, it can basically go an infinite number of cycles and will never fail. And and if loaded in the direction meant to be loaded, some bicycles, some racing bicycles are in that machine. Um, some steel racing bicycles. Aluminum and brass and, and carbon fibers are less extent. They always have this, this um, downward slope. So that means that there's always some combination where you're going to have some number of cycles 
in some stress amplitude where it's going to fail. It's just a matter of when. And in most of these cases, the designers know to try to predict how many stress cycles they think that this vehicle or structure is going to have to sustain over its lifetime. And then they'll make sure that they're, they design maybe a little bit, um, a little bit of a, a factor of safety. So they get a couple more cycles. And they just say, okay, basically, no one's ever going to ride this thing past this number of cycles. So it'll be fine. And there's, there's, there, you know, like I think like, so airplanes, there probably are some parts on airplanes that are like that, but most of them, I think, you know, that's why they're always looking for cracks on airplanes because they know that there's some combination of stress and cycles where some parts can fail on an airplane no matter what. So they, they constantly inspect fuselages and engine mounts and all, you know, these wind mounts and these sorts of things to make sure they're not, they're not getting uh, too many cycles. The, um, it's a little unclear to me what, why some materials have a fatigue limit like steel, do, steel does and why some materials don't have a fatigue limit. It has something to do with what's called the stacking fault energy. So when you start arranging atoms in, in planes of atoms, you know, nothing's ever perfect. There's always mismatched things that are out of place, right? Because it's all consistent anyway. These atoms are moving around or wiggling or vibrating in their, their lattice position. It's all on average. So, so different materials have different stacking fault energies. And some materials, if they have a, um, a low stacking fault energy, they tend to have a fatigue limit. If they, if they have a high stacking fault energy, they tend, they tend not to have a, a fatigue limit. So steel has a fatigue limit. Nickel alloys have a fatigue limit. Titanium has a fatigue limit. That's one of the things that makes it good for bicycles. Um, but aluminum, copper, brass, those materials, magnesium, especially magnesium, those, those materials don't have fatigue limits. There's always some combination of stress and cycles where they're going to fail. It, it, it like stops um, so, um, so you understand what I'm saying? That there's that there's some point where if, if you have some piece of metal or steel or whatever it is, and you're it's going through some cycle of stress, right? And you know, tensile compression, tensile compression, or tensile tensile tensile, or compression compression compression. There's I don't want to get too far into fatigue, but we can, we can talk about it if you want. But there's they define like the you know whether it's going in full reversal or not reversal with this thing having R value. Um, so the reason they okay, so with steel, there's some combination where if you're below a certain stretch, you'll never have a failure. So that's the limit. That's the fatigue limit. That's where the curve goes horizontal. So there's there's a limit to where fatigue has an effect. Um okay, this is this is getting the area where I have to start reading heavily to remember how to do it. <laughs> but that's okay. Now, um, I, these are questions I've been asking for a long time too. And um, I have a Super Suresh's book on you know, at my house and my desk. I have to write it. But um, Super Suresh is a terrific professor, and that's why I told him that he wrote that book. The finding book on fatigue. But you um, you have some structural member, right? And you uh, you have you have some structural member. Okay. okay? No, uh, no, like this. Um, and maybe it's just going through some kind of stress, right? And you say, okay, well, what's the stress? The stress equals the force over the area, right? Here's the force. You know, here's the area. This is this is like the first approximation. This is the approach that 99.99% of people use. The problem with this is that this assumes some degree of homogeneity in the material. And if you if you if you could look through this with a microscope, you could see what the cross section looks like. There's voids. There's there's little particles in there. So this this A is really not really the, the right thing to be used. Okay, where where you have some some little void in here, the stress is top stress this way. The stress is will dramatically um, peak around that little opening here because it's you're having material between the supports so the stress goes somewhere when it's stress concentrations if it's a crack and it's only sharp a crack they call the singularity so theoretically the stress goes to infinity but what happens is, is that you start getting you start loading things and it's like with, you know you start loading these things that are cyclic uh, loading in here and what happens is, is that the stresses get so high in these little, these little areas that you start getting little cracks forming at the, at the sort of the extremities of this little void here, for example. 
Okay, so it's not homogeneous, it's very heterogeneous actually. And it's these little voids of things that lead to these stress concentrations, which lead to these little cracks. With time, with time cycling, 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 these cracks they propagate a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a couple microns at a time. And eventually, eventually you've got so much of the cross section that it has a big crack in it that this A is actually way small, but the F hasn't changed. And at that point, when you hit that, that threshold, then the crack just propagates through the whole cross section. What's the limit? So the limit somehow it has to do with the material, I guess, being able to blunt out those stress concentrations in these these things so that you don't you don't have these stress concentrations that lead to these really uh, initiation of these micro cracks and then little micro propagation of those cracks which each cycle of stress. That's how fatigue works. And it's you know a lot of people say well composite materials like the carbon fiber composite doesn't have a fatigue limit. And some people say they do have fatigue and there's 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 camp of people that say they do there's camp of people that say they don't. Um, and you know, just because it's plastic and it doesn't have the crystal lab and all that thing doesn't mean it doesn't have voids and stress concentrations inside of it. So this is this is the area I think where the, the whole thing gets a little murky about what materials fatigue and which ones don't. Is it basically just like there are situations where you don't really need to consider fatigue for the ones that don't specifically have that have a limit, whereas you always need to consider it for the other ones? So static loading, you don't really need to worry about fatigue, right? If, if, if there, there it, it, what, what I'm kind of gathering is that if it doesn't have a fatigue limit, that if it's under cyclic loading, right. then there will be fatigue. Yeah. Whereas if there is a fatigue limit, maybe you don't have to like, worry. Right. Maybe you're able to blunt out the cracks that's associated with these okay. impure imperfections in the inside of the material, and then the cracks don't propagate. But this table, for example, this table will probably never fail from fatigue. I bet my life on it. It stays in a compressive load at full life, right? It's under the same load within a little bit of difference if somebody sits on it or somebody puts a big heavy backpack or something on it. But it's not really that fatigue loaded. It's never going to see lots of cycles. This, this table will never fail in compression, I can guarantee you. Unless you try to, right? Unless you put a tractor or something up on a car on top of it, right? It's not going to fail. That's the situation where you don't have to fail. The, um, so aluminum doesn't have a fatigue limit. Um, a lot of mechanical engineers that I've worked with don't understand the difference between the two. Uh, no, no offense to any mechanical engineers, the same ones I've worked with the car companies. Um, and I've, you know, I've, I've, I've had explained these things to a lot of people over the years. But, but um, the um, today a lot of car suspensions are made out of cast aluminum and forged aluminum parts. Back in the back in the '90s, that wasn't the case. All the parts were basically cast iron and, and steel parts. And then when when the government starts putting screws on the car companies to get better gas mileage, they got to find a way to shed weight. So one thing they do is they start looking at aluminum suspension components. Right. So the the um, when I was at Chrysler, we first started working on the first aluminum uh, steering uh, steering component called the knuckle, part of the suspension um, for the uh, Grand Cherokee, the Jeep Grand Cherokee. And you know, the requirement is that it has to a certain number of fatigue cycles. And so they start off with some design that's based on a finite element analysis. They say, okay, the stress on this part is here. We don't know how this thing could perform under fatigue. So we're just gonna, we're just gonna estimate. We say 75% fatigue limit. So you take 75% of the yield strength, you design the part so you're at 75% of the yield strength, but those stress in the part under normal loading is above that 75%. And they had they had failures um, during testing. They had to keep adding aluminum back. In order to get the stress low enough so the part would go enough a decent number of cycles. They kept doing this over and over again. But basically, they were back to the way that the cast iron was. So, and, and that had a lot to do with the fact that they weren't using very high quality castings and they didn't, they didn't understand the aluminum they were using and, and how to make them clean and everything. But uh, just, just keep this in mind when you're, when you're designing things, it's not only stress, it's fatigue too. Don't forget that. All right, I see we are out of time. Um, I was going to talk about impact loading and how there's materials that are. Used for impact in cars, for example, and used to store of energy in an impact. But uh, I guess we'll talk about that next time. Um, really? On the
see next week. Anyway, um, yeah, don't forget to teach. But, you know, I know you might not be into bicycles, but I can see where that might have been kind of boring, but I just, yeah, just, I, just I think that it's not, it's not just about bicycles. It's just, I'm just showing you how in, in, in the real world, how materials and geometry are used to produce good. Any questions online, guys? Anyone still there? I have, I have a quick question for you, Dr. Beskin. Sure, the, I understand that with carbon fiber tubes, uh, going back to that hybrid bike that was like carbon fiber tubes and had stainless steel like joints effectively or connections. This one. Yeah. So I understand why they have to use stainless steel there versus aluminum, just because there's like a corrosion effect from, I think it's the epoxies that they use as the matrix for carbon fiber uh, composites. Correct. Now, the next one you said was, um, this one what was it? Yeah, where it wasn't carbon, but it was like glass and Kevlar or something like that. I think you said, and it had aluminum connections. Yeah, these are carbon and Kevlar. Oh, carbon and Kevlar, but they have aluminum lugs. How Correct. did they get around the corrosion issue on this, or was that part of the problem with these? <laughs> they didn't. <laughs> oh, okay. They didn't, and a lot of these bikes failed. I, I had a, yeah, this there was there was there was some other carbon fiber aluminum lug frames in addition to this one that were on the market at the same time. One of my friends I used to race with, he he had um, he had the joint down here fail on him because of galvanic corrosion between the aluminum and the carbon fiber. Right. And I think anybody me included uh, who buys one of these as a vintage bike, you know, just out of nostalgia, praise that that didn't happen. So mm -hmm. I, I um, you know, I'm not important here, but I'll just use me as a stupid example. You know, I, I um, I'm fascinated by this bicycle because it was the first carbon fiber bike in the Tour de France. I right. searched months and months and months to find one because they're really rare. I find one beat up one in Germany and have it with the guy, bought the bike, sends it over. So now I've got the frame and, and the frame was in rough shape. It was pretty scratched up and, you know, decals were all broken and anyway. And um, I don't know, you know, I don't know if the joints are going to fail or not. Interesting. Of any corrosion. Yeah, you know, I know so that it's an uh, issue with aircraft uh, folks as panels are becoming more composite. Um, they actually find out that it's like putting weight back in because every fastener you have to use instead of being some you know, aluminum or tie fastener now has to be some kind of stainless fastener. Exactly. Uh, so it's it's kind of like um, a weight neutral trade study, and it's a huge cost increase. But like, there's still marginal weight benefits. So they obviously aerospace goes with it. But right. it's just I find it a very interesting problem. I still think I need to understand the mechanism of why it corrodes. But oh, I can tell you. You remember when you're taking chemistry? Do you remember the electronegativity charts? About yeah, yeah. Back up an electron. Yeah. That's what that's that's the fundamental fundamental thing yeah. behind galvanic corrosion. So carbon fiber, yeah. will, carbon fiber will carbon will suck an electron off of just about any metal. Yep. So once you've got that electron missing from the metal, then oxygen comes in and oxidizes. That, there you go. Yeah, that's right. That makes sense. And then once that once that start happens, it's you've got a galvanic corrosion couple. And these these bikes, they weren't real careful with um with, with this, I, you know, they knew about it, they didn't know about it, they didn't care, I don't know, but they, you know, there, there have been a lot of these frames that have failed and, you know, you have to, they may have known about it, they may have said, well, if we put enough epoxy in there, we'll cut off the oxygen supply so it won't oxidize. I don't know right. what they're thinking, um, but um, like I said, a lot of these failed. Um, there's a lot that are, that are okay, a lot of them failed and um, yeah. who knows. I mean, it'll probably work for you know a couple months and then give up. <laughs> well, I hope not. At, at a minimum from factory, yeah. 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 Well, have a good day. Thank you for answering my question. Oh, you're welcome. Any other questions out there? You guys good? Yep. Take care. We'll see you guys next week. Come to class next week. Show up in person so you can play with stuff. We're gonna have um, bicycles and things to look at. Okay.